Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text for this evening is recorded in the gospel reading that was just read, where Thomas answered Jesus, my Lord and my God, and Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is our text for this evening. In the name of Jesus, dear Christian friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You know, I am so happy that Jesus promised that all who believe in him would live forever. How happy I am that you decided to continue to celebrate his resurrection with us this evening. You see, our short lives here on earth are simply not long enough for us to think about all the wonderful things that our God has in store for us. For just a moment, I want you to think about the life of Jesus. I mean, every event in the life of Jesus gives us more and more to think about. Think about what it means to have the Son of God take on human flesh, come down to the earth as we celebrate it at Christmas time. An event that we celebrate for our whole life. Think about the Lord's Prayer. You know, meditating on those petitions of the Lord's Prayer could keep us occupied until the end of our days. There's a lifetime of study in each of the seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross as we heard last week on Good Friday. What I'm saying is that no matter how many times We open the pages of Holy Scripture. It has new things in it to teach us every time we open it. And there's one event in the life of Jesus that just overshadows all the rest. His resurrection. An event that we'll never fully understand until we rise from the dead, stand in the presence of Jesus forever, and all our questions will be answered at that point. Now, our text for this, this evening tells us about two appearances of Jesus to his disciples after his resurrection. And I have to tell you, this is the same exact text that we use every year on the second Sunday of Easter. Because it talks about an appearance to Jesus' disciples one week after his resurrection. Well, guess what? It's one week after Jesus, our celebration of the resurrection. And so we to use this text. You know the details. The first time Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection, Thomas is not there. I mean, we don't know where he was. Maybe he was off grieving the death of Jesus or some such thing. All we know is that he was not with the rest of the disciples on that first Easter evening when Jesus appeared to them. But a week later, our text tells us that Thomas showed up. He was with the rest of the apostles. But Thomas had already made a great challenge to Jesus. He said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and feet and the spear hole in his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. And from that point on, we've called him Doubting Thomas. (laughs) Kind of an interesting name, isn't it? But what I think we often forget is that it wasn't only Thomas. I mean, every last one of Jesus' disciples were in total pagans on the weekend of his crucifixion and resurrection. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) I'm not preaching heresy by saying that. Jesus had promised all of them that he was going to be arrested, he was going to be crucified, and on the third day, what? What? He was going to rise again, right? When Jesus died on that cross, his disciples firmly believed that they would never see him again. So for a few days on that first Easter weekend, all those disciples were unbelievers. You know, that ought to be a real comfort to us. (laughs) Every Every one of us has those days when we really don't feel very Christian. Every one of us has those days when we wonder why we keep on trying to live according to the ways that God has laid down for us. I mean, our life is just full of doubts, isn't it? 
We sometimes wonder if God is really out there, if he's really listening to our prayers, he's listening to our petitions. Sometimes it seems like life is coming up roses for everybody else except me. Am I right? Isn't this the way you sometimes feel? Or am I the only one that feels that way? Aren't there times in your life when you feel like all this stuff that we call living is all for nothing? What I'm saying is that when we have those days, isn't it comforting to see how Jesus continued to show himself to his disciples? I mean, look, did you notice that Jesus didn't wait for the disciples to look for him? (laughs) These guys were hiding in a locked room. But Jesus found them, even behind these locked doors. And what a blessing it was when their Lord Jesus greeted them with a tremendous phrase, peace be with you. Jesus appeared to his pagan disciples and he gave them his peace. He didn't punish them for leaving him alone in the, in the darkest hour in Gethsemane. He didn't reject them when they failed to believe everything that he told them. He didn't scold them for not remembering his word that he would rise from the dead. No, he, he comes into their midst and he says, peace be with you. He gave them his peace. And then he gave them every proof that he had kept his promise, that he really did rise from the dead. He showed them the scars of the crucifixion and the spear. And with these signs, they saw and believed that this was indeed their friend and their master, the one who had died on the cross, but who was now alive again. In this gentle way, Jesus restored their hope and strengthened their faith in him. You see, in our, in our text, we can't focus on doubting Thomas or the unbelief of the other disciples. What we need to focus on here instead is the grace of Jesus as he comes to bring comfort to everybody who's troubled or frightened. I mean, he comforted and strengthened his disciples so much that our text says that they were glad when they saw the Lord. And that's the way Jesus comes to all who are needy and anxious. He comes to you and me too, in his word and in his sacraments, to bring us the comfort that our sins are forgiven, that we have been given the gift of everlasting life. And you know, after Jesus assured his disciples that he was really alive, he did something really incredible. He ordained these doubting disciples as his apostles. And he said to them, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. You know, a disciple and an apostle are not the same thing. I know we use the words interchangeably at times, but a disciple is a student. A disciple is a student who follows the teachings of a particular teacher. An apostle is one who is sent out with that teaching. So every apostle has to be a disciple, but Jesus didn't send out every disciple as an apostle. But those 11 he sent were bringing his message of salvation throughout the entire world. In other words, when we hear the words of the apostles, we are hearing the words of Jesus. It's a great and glorious thing for me and for all my fellow faithful preachers of the word of God to have this treasure that Jesus gave to his apostles. And yet as glorious and as as much of a treasure as God's word is, Jesus gave even more gifts to his apostles. He gave them the ability to forgive and retain sins. Our text says that he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Just as Jesus breathed his breath of life into the first man, Adam, and he became a living soul, so also Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into these apostles. And the Holy Spirit would work through these apostles to deliver the forgiveness 
that Jesus earned for us on the cross. It's an amazing thing that the mouth of every faithful preacher can be the mouth of Jesus to his people. When I stand up here and forgive your sins in the name of Jesus, you notice that I don't say, well, Jesus forgives you. I say, no, in, uh, under his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I am placing the very forgiveness that Jesus won for you on you. I'm not giving you my forgiveness, but the Holy Spirit works through me as an ordained pastor to deliver to you the forgiveness of Jesus. I mean, besides all the other parts of the liturgy, as we are speaking it tonight, it's worth it to come into the sanctuary as often as possible and to hear Jesus' words from the mouth of your pastor when he says, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For with these words, Jesus promises to you heaven itself. You know, if you were to ask the average person on the street if they want to go to heaven, you know what their answer would be? Oh yeah, I'd love to go to heaven. So how sad is it that many people don't know that Jesus offers himself to us here, right here in the church, every time we participate in a divine service like we're doing tonight. How sad it is that Jesus has placed the very forgiveness of sins in the mouths of his faithful pastors, and yet so many people just walk by and can care less what the preacher says. How sad it is that so many people don't know about the precious gift of heaven that Jesus yearns to give them. You see, that's what our text for this evening gives us. The great gifts that Jesus wants to give us. He patiently ignores the doubting hearts of his, of his disciples in order to show them that he is really alive. And then he sends his apostles out into the world so that our church down through the ages would have that word of God through, the mouth, through their mouths and pens. And he puts his own forgiveness into the mouths of his faithful pastors of his church. You see, our text for this evening, it shows us how gracious Jesus is, not only with Thomas, but with all his disciples. Even though the disciples denied him and abandoned Jesus at his most trying hour, even though they believed he was dead and gone, even though they continued to sin daily, Jesus didn't reject them. Instead, he made them a part of his plan to bring the good news of salvation to the entire world. And this, in this evening, we're in that group also. Even though we've denied and abandon Jesus with our sin, and even though we sometimes doubt whether he really is alive or not, and even though we sin daily and deserve nothing from our gracious Savior, our Lord Jesus saw to it that his message has come down to us, and we hear his words of forgiveness, and we believe his words so that one day we believers will see the glories of heaven. And it won't be a little glimpse of heaven like we heard in the book of Revelation from John. It's going to be the full picture. In our text, we learn that Jesus doesn't deal with us as we deserve. But he deals with us in a way that we don't deserve. He seeks us out as sheep who have gone astray. In spite of the many fa our many failings and sins, Jesus continues to supply us with his loving and gracious forgiveness. In spite of all those many failings, he has chosen to make us his own forever and ever. I can't think of a better text that we could listen to for our text this evening. Coming down from, our, uh, from the high of our celebration of Jesus' resurrection, here it is only one week after our celebration. And already look at our congregation. Where are all the people? Where are all those people who filled our pews just last weekend? Where are all the people who came to Jesus' altar last weekend and communed at this altar? Are these the doubting Thomases of today? No, we don't focus on Thomas. We don't focus on other doubters today. Today we again 
focus on Jesus. And we focus on his promises of life to us because that's our comfort and that's our peace. And that's why we continue to rejoice and we continue to shout the words, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah and amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forever. Amen.